Well, um, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my uh, name is uh, John Yu. The uh, only thing I've ever done of note is I've clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas in <laughs> 1994 and 1995. Um, what about those memos? <laughs> I don't talk about memos anymore, Justice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, the Justice and also tell you all about a change in the format. The, Justice said he would rather have a conversation with all of us for the next hour. Um, so I'm going to ask him a few questions for the first half of that, and then I will take questions from the audience for the second half of that. Um, also, I just want to remember to uh, say on behalf of uh, the American Enterprise Institute, who's President Robert Doerr is here, and uh, Hoover Institution, and Manhattan Institute. I know, Ray Rayhan, where I know you're here. Rehan Salam, thank you. I want to thank you for uh, joining us this evening. And I think, uh, I'm sure you and all of us want to join, uh, Harlan, uh, thank Harlan Crow and his family for making this wonderful <laughs> facility available to us. I know Harlan hates that, no, so I knew we had to do it. That's why I wouldn't say it. <laughs> I knew we had to do it. I like to keep that friendship. <laughs> Oh, so it's going to be like that kind of evening. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> You're used to being thrown under the bus. <laughs> You're a very good bus driver, which we're going to get to. Oh, yeah. Later, oh, God. Though, so <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, let me just, uh, you all know Justice Thomas's biography, of course. He was from Pinpoint, Georgia, uh, went to Holy Cross for college, uh, Yale Law School. Um, he then became an aide in the Senate to Senator John Danforth from Missouri. Um, he <laughs> he um, became an official in the Education Department in the early years of the Reagan administration, and then from there became chairman of the EEOC. Uh, and then the uh, first President Bush uh, appointed him to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, the same court on which uh, Judge Brown, who you saw earlier today, yeah. served. And then in 1991, Justice Thomas joined uh, the Supreme Court um, at the tender age of 42, I think, Three. 43 years old, who's counting. Um, and he just celebrated last year his 30th year on the court. Um, <laughs> And so just as, as a means of introduction before I ask the first question, I was trying to think of uh, the thing I think that defines your tenure on the court the most. I mean, some people say you are the most committed to interpreting the Constitution based on the understanding of those who drafted and ratified it. Some people say you're the person who's most likely to say the emperor has no clothes when the court goes off on some long, uh, trail of precedent and increasingly doesn't make sense. You're the one who brings them back to reality. But I um, just wanted to read briefly uh, what I think would be uh, meaningful for many of the people here was the uh, way you ended your speech uh, before the National Bar Association. Um, you said... That was a uh, long time ago. A long time ago, yes. Um, but I, it sounds like you just wrote these yesterday, actually. This, uh, so this is a, for those of you who don't know, this is a bar association set up by uh, leaders of the black bar and bench. Mm. And uh, you, there were some controversy about a lot your of invitation. So it follows me around. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that too, don't worry. And so you said to them at the end of your speech, you said, I have come here today not in anger or to anger, though my mere presence has been sufficient, obviously, to anger some. Nor have I come to defend my views, but rather to assert my right to think for myself, to refuse to have my ideas assigned to me as though I was an intellectual slave because I'm black. I come to state that I'm a man, free to think for myself and do as I please. I have come to assert that I'm a judge and I will not be consigned the unquestioned opinion of others. And And so, uh, to me, I think uh, what your time on the court is, and then we're going to get to the questions. I'm, st I'm going to stop buttering you up. Is that uh, <laughs> is that you're the, you really show the importance of ideas? 
more than anything else, you, my time working for you and watching you since then, you're not there to assemble five votes to win. Your uh, influence has come because of what you've written on the page and over time, I think we've, we're seeing more and more that you have persuaded your colleagues and we're seeing now opinions I used to insert into, into opinions 30 years ago. I had no idea why you were doing it. And now actually I, I get it. The ideas took 30 you years. You were young, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's enough introduction. <laughs> so, uh, Justice, um, first question. Is there anything going on at the court these days? <laughs> When you go back to Washington, could you tell your colleagues that uh, next time they leak an opinion, could they just give it to me and I'll leak it for them? <laughs> Why are they going through these other methods? I, you have too much character to leak. Um, but in seriousness, Justice, uh, you know, one theme that's come out of this conference, I think, is the importance of institutions yeah. and that institutions are under attack these days. Um, so I thought you might want to comment on the leaks, the protests at Justices' homes and what we're seeing in the wake of this leak of the alleged Dobbs draft opinion. Well, I've, uh, first of all, it's um, a real honor to be here. This is, it's hard to believe that 40, more than 40 years have passed since um, I um, was at the Fairmont Conference, which was, I was just <clears throat> no more enthusiastic about that than I am about this one. Um, and I think it started off with, uh, I thought, a um, very electric speech by Glenn Lowry, and it has continued with the thoughtfulness, and that's really all we ever wanted, um, not to replace one orthodoxy with another orthodoxy. We had enough of that, but rather to assume that people are able to think for themselves, to have different ideas because they're unique, uh, to exchange different perspectives and perhaps have others uh, either agree with them or sharpen their disagreements, uh, but to have a civil discussion. That was all. That's why it was called uh, New Alternatives. Uh, it was an alternative to, uh, it's the kind of alternatives you would want in a, uh, a, what we thought, at least in a civil society. And um, it certainly was, uh, did not, was not treated that way. And that sort of, we were treated very shabbily after that. Uh, the, the whole idea, to your point about um, institutions, I think we are in danger of destroying the institutions that are required for a free society. Uh, you can't have a, a, a civil society, a free society, without a stable legal system. Uh, you can't have one without stability in things like property or um, interpretation and impartial judiciary. Uh, and I've been at, in this business long enough to know just how fragile it is. And the institution that I'm a part of uh, if someone said that one line of one opinion would be leaked by anyone and you would say, that, oh, that's impossible. No one would ever do that. There's such a uh, belief in the rule of law, a belief in the court, a belief in what we were doing, that that was verboten. It was beyond anyone's understanding or at least anyone's uh, imagination that someone would do that. And look where we are, where now that trust or that belief is gone forever. Um, the, and when you lose that trust, especially in the institution that I'm in, uh, it changes the institution fundamentally. Uh, you begin to look over your shoulder. It's like kind of an infidelity um, that you can explain it, but you can't undo it. And um, the, and I think you're seeing it go through any number of our institutions, whether it's in the political branches or whether it's in the universities. When I went to a university, to college, it was the fun place where you were not that well informed, but boy, you debated all night. 
and then the people with whom you just argue. Like, just like the Supreme Court. Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, so the, but the friends that you made during that time, you kept for life. You, uh, you, and you pick up the arguments 10 years later, and you're still arguing. And you're still loving being around each other. You remember the bad pizza and uh, too many uh, mugs of beer and uh, a reason why many of us don't drink anymore. <laughs> but it, my point is simply that, that even the universities have changed. I was at the University of Georgia uh, about a year ago and I met with a lot of students. And their question was, why can't we in the general society debate difficult things anymore. And I said to them, and these were small groups, I met with a group of 10 students, uh, 15 separate groups for about an hour. It was very uh, exhausting, but enormously, enormously informative. And the, um, the, you know, I said to them that to me, the epicenter of free speech when I was in, it was at the university. That's where you learn how to, to, to engage with people who disagreed with you. That's where you learned how to deal with ideas and address ideas that you had not, you were not, with which you were not familiar previously or with which you disagreed. And it was back and forth and I just loved it. And, and, and we called them rap sessions back then. And they said, I said, but now look at your university. We're at the, this is the University of Georgia. I said, how many of you can take a view on this campus of traditional families? And of course, nobody, or you got a lot of people staring at the floor. How many of you can take a pro-life position on this campus, staring at the floor? And as you go on and on, uh, you take positions that are obviously at odds with the current mood on these campuses. Now this is, a, this is where you learn how to deal with views that are different. Now if you don't learn at that point, the law schools are just as bad now. At John's alma mater, Yale, uh, the, um, they just... <laughs> Did you give your degree back again? <laughs> uh, Yale does not recognize me. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> okay. Oh, so we're in the same boat. <laughs> but um, they just protested uh, a group uh, and made it very difficult for others to come and certainly had a chilling effect. Now, Yale was, when I was there visiting, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was anything goes. Is you do your thing, I do my thing. And maybe too much of that but it certainly wasn't prior restraint. And it certainly wasn't censorship, but here we are, where that's acceptable at one of the elite universities. It's, and it's pretty much acceptable at all the universities. And if, they, if we're there with these institutions, how do we recover? So yeah, I do think that the, the, what happened at the court is tremendously bad. I think it's, um, I wonder how long we're going to have uh, these institutions at the rate we're undermining them. And uh, then I wonder when they're gone or they are destabilized, what we will have as a country. And I don't think that the prospects are good if, uh, if we continue to lose them. Thank you. I know you can't speak much more about the court, so uh, maybe we could start with the, uh, uh, how you got to the Fairmount Conference back in 1980. And so um, I dug up a story yeah. about the Fairmount Conference uh, by a Washington Post reporter. Mm. At the very end of his story, he said he met Clarence Thomas, a young aide to Senator John Danforth, who spoke with barely controlled exhilaration quote, it's really kind of good to be here because someone might agree with me for a change. <laughs> so in 30 years, something still don't change. 
Except I couldn't care less of this. <laughs> uh, so how did you, you what's the intellectual you know, journey that got you to me, that point? For me, and I'll try to be brief, I grew up at a time when I liked where I grew up. And I, I liked uh, when I grew up, how I grew up, uh, and, and where I grew up. Uh, you had segregation, which wasn't good, but I had a stable, you know, and, and, and stable uh, neighborhood. I had a stable household. They were my grandparents, but it was the essence of stability. Uh, they had no education. My grandfather had nine months. My grandmother six uh, years and uh, went to the sixth grade. I don't know how many months she went. And, but they believed in education for us. So they were not educated, but they believed with all their heart that education was critical. Devoutly religious, religious neighborhood. We were Catholic, so we were an oddity. My grandmother was Baptist. And you went to church on Sunday, you rode, you got your Western flyer bike and you rode all over town. Since nothing was open on Sundays, you rode all over Savannah's. You're little kids, 10, 11, 12 years old, riding all over Savannah. You had your U.S. Army backpack and you walked to school every day uh, in the inner city. How many kids walk to school in the inner city at nine? At six, seven, eight, nine years old now. Um, you, I served six o'clock mass, walked by myself in the dark, and my biggest fear was stray dogs, which there were a lot of back then. <laughs> and, um, but I liked it. But when I got up north, suddenly you take sociology and, and suddenly you're told that you were alienated. I wasn't alienated from anybody. I liked, I liked my life. And I, the, the, the terms that I'd never heard of, like anime, you know? Um, the, almost as suddenly we're supposed to be pathological. We, are, we're supposed to convert a past that we had always thought of as a positive past into this sort of negative, this pathological past. And I, w I couldn't do that. And I couldn't disavow my grandparents. I couldn't disavow my nuns, this, the education I had. But all the inputs that I was getting up north was that it was all bad. And I was a little bit, and I was very angry about the race issue, which is a bad combination. I mean, I was really angry. We were over at Harvard, um, Harvard Square. We tried to burn that down. And uh, so you, you can just see how angry we were. And it's a, that was a stupid thing to do. But hey, I was a, at the stupid age. And I was very upset about race and what we had done with race in the society. But the... The, 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 the ideology of us having to um, negate the lives that we had had previously in order to support the, the prevailing ideological attitudes was, uh, it was very difficult for me. Anyway, when I finished law school and couldn't get a job in Georgia, that's another thing that ticked me off. I was really had a lot of reasons to be mad at a lot of people. So I wound up in, in Jeff City, Missouri, with, which was very comforting because it was quiet and peaceful. And it was, the people were honest, finally, including, especially Senator Danforth. And I started thinking about trying to reconcile what people were saying and what I knew. In other words, what they were saying about the world and the world I actually knew that I grew up in, the experiences I had in the seminary and elsewhere. And so a friend of mine who knew about this, he was a quadriplegic from polio and a very close buddy of mine, he calls me up in my office and said, Clarence, I'm reading this review in the Wall Street Journal. There's another black guy like you. His name is Thomas Sowell. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a review of his book, Race and Economics. I'll, let you, I'll bring it over tomorrow. And I said, no, I'll come get it. So I ran down and just like got this uh, book review by Michael Novak. And there it was. There was Tom Sowell. And I got his book eventually, read it after some trouble, read it like a, a thirsty person off the desert drinking water. And... There it was, it was reconciled. Finally, somebody was telling the truth. And the, I went to St. Louis and this is 76 and 78, I go to St. I'm working at Monsanto. 
someone says they know how passionate I am about this Thomas Sowell guy. And um, they mentioned that he's going to be at Washington University Law School, where he was in a, on a panel with Professor Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> and uh, so I go over and I follow the poor man around. He was trying to leave and I was a stalker and <laughs> <laughs> I, I admit it. I'm, and he signed my book, he autographed my book and looked at me kind of awkwardly. And, I would see him again after I moved to Washington when a bunch of black staffers were giving him a hard time and I defended him. And he would come over to my office, I shared with three others, and we would talk. Uh, and he took my number and I took his. Calling him, you may as well just forget the number. If he gives it to you, just burn it. You'll never get him. Uh, I learned that the hard way. And, well, I can now, but back then he wouldn't, there's no way. And he called me, he took that number that I had given him and he called me to come to the Fairmont Conference. And that's how it started it. And that started a friendship that has lasted from 19, uh, the late 70s to, to the present, or maybe the 1980 to the present. And one failure for us after all that exuberance at the conference is we have had nothing to show for it other than one little report. We had no organization. Um, Clarence Pendleton tried to do it and they isolated him and beat him up and he went to the Civil Rights Commission eventually. Then, um, who am I thinking of? Lee Walker had a small branch of it in Chicago um, and he kept it going. He was a great guy. But the, the negativity was overwhelming. So one of the things we hoped that would come out of this is we don't have that sense similar failure where it ends when we close the conference door. Uh, there's got to be more than that or you'll be here 40 years from now telling people that 40 years ago you had a conference and nothing came of it. And you're thinking that is two generations. That is two generations. That is four score. Well, uh, Justice, you um, uh, have been going to all the panels. You've been oh, yeah. excited. I missed one because they were talking about a case, the court case. A, a yeah. case. But other than that one, you've, I've seen you. You've been like you're back in uh, high school again. Oh, yeah. Taking notes, arguing with people. Uh, I, <laughs> took pic I took pictures of your notes because I know you're going to try to destroy them later. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, you're going to leak them? <laughs> yeah, well, I know where to go. Politico, Politico is going to, Politico will publish anything I give him now. Yeah. Um, but, but what I ask is, um, uh, you seem like you're, you're excited now as you were f uh, 40 years yeah. ago. Did you, what have you heard here today in all these panels uh, that's different? than what you were thinking about studying 40 years ago at the last conference? You know, fortunately or unfortunately, it's the same story, different day. It is probably um, farther down the road. Uh, the auto wedlock birth rate wasn't where it is. We warned about that. Uh, Tom, Professor Soule constantly warned about uh, single parent households and the damage that was going to do, and it has, particularly with poverty uh, and the, the, the sort of the pathologies that flows from, flows from that. Um, but I just think it's a lot of the same. And the, there was one point where people, you know, the point that was reiterated that eventually we may not have caused this problem on our own, but eventually we have to be the ones to lead us out of it. But that is something that I have known virtually my entire life, and it's certainly a point that I made when I was, uh, and others made, at the Fairmont Conference. But the sad thing for me is that it's the same thing. It's probably done a lot better. This conference is a lot better organized, I think, than ours was. <laughs> All right. And I love the panels. I love the discussion. The, but the, the, I love the in-depth attitude. Um, the, the, um, Shelby Steele was um, 
his insights for me were very important. Uh, and you know, things like, um, uh, such as being free. And I especially liked it since he wrote um, a review of my book and said I was the freest black man in America. <laughs> and, that's, and I thought that was probably one of the best essays ever written about me and one of the few that I actually read. <laughs> um, but it was, and his point was really quite, I really, and I took it to heart. I mean, I, what I, it is, I felt coming from that conference, ver, ver, uh, I felt as though I had company. I felt that I wasn't crazy. Uh, that, and now, of course, I know I'm not. The people that I have run into across this country, people assume that I've had difficulties when I've been around members of my race. It's just the opposite. The only people with whom I've had difficulties are white liberal uh, elites uh, who consider themselves the anointed and us the benighted, as Tom Sowell would say. Uh, I have never had issues with members of my race. Uh, you sit, I went to University of Georgia some years ago, and of course people from what they heard, they were a little bit upset and then we sat, and three hours later, do you get, you know, like, you think that we all grew up in the same neighborhood, because in a sense we had shared experiences. But what they have been doing, I just think of this, and this is a question I ask young people, particularly members of our race, my race, um, afterwards. I say, now explain to me after three hours one thing you heard that you found objectionable. And the answer is invariably nothing. And I said, well, what is it? Those people who are doing all this uh, and printing all this negative stuff, all this fly, what don't they want you to hear? Because they haven't changed me. What is it they don't want you to know? And that's the way I sort of take it. They, you know, the, 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 the discussions today about the police, for example, I don't have all that data, but ask yourself. They're not necessarily censoring you. They don't want others to hear and what you have to say. And if they do hear it, they don't want them to believe it. So they load you up with negativity and they give you challenges as far as credibility to prevent you from getting to their ears. And the most, most interesting thing I've heard over the years is when I meet people, they said, well, I thought you were someone else. You're not, as one guy told me, I was in Atlanta giving a speech and this very tall, imposing black gentleman came up to me, tears streaming down his face. He said, why are they lying about you? Hmm. And because he knows this wasn't about me, it was about people who needed to hear about that part of life that they knew little about, about the court, about law. I mean, it's about, let's just say economics. Wouldn't you want to know the truth about economics? Why don't you want to know the truth? If you look at Tom Sowell's writings, look at rhetoric and reality. He's telling you, he's saying, look, here's what they're saying, here's the reality. You know, my quote this year that has become one favorite of mine, I got it in the Sultz and Neats, and I don't know, I read all over, I tend to wander around, and it's one minute you're reading about the Vikings, the next minute it's the Sultz and Neats, and, and, um, and it's, he has this wonderful little short essay, Live Not By Lies. And that be the, it, that's sort of the, a different version of tell the truth. Live not by lies. And I think we have been allowing people to force us to live by their lies. That they say things that are obviously not true, obviously not supportable, and we take it as fact and then we move from that. And Tom Sowell, if you look at him, he talks often about false premises. If you look at his interviews, he always attacks the premise. And much of my own opinions, the, the stare decisis issues, is attacking the false premises. And so, again, even if you take nothing away from my, the time I spend here, just live not by lies. Just read that Solzhenitsyn essay. You don't repeat lies. You don't, uh, 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 you don't uh, uh, tell other people things that you know are untrue. 
You don't give it wings. You don't give it a life. You end it. You tell the truth. That is what got us in trouble. We refuse to tell lies. I was recently wrote an opinion on uh, the difference between crack and powder cocaine. I was interested in seeing how many people did not want it known that black politicians agitated for a crackdown on crack cocaine. They said it was a crisis of crack cocaine. They wanted higher penalties and it had unintended consequences. But it, was, it wasn't, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. This is a fact. And but people want to now reconfigure the facts to fit the current narrative. And it's not, that is a lie. In order now, you can say, I'm sorry I, I supported it 20 or 30 years ago when I thought there was a, a bigger problem, but you don't lie about it. And I think we're living by many, many lies and many lies are being told about us. And the beauty of Tom Soul, I think he's a great man. I think he is, to me, one the single greatest intellectual alive. And <laughs> this, this conference is the one thing he wanted to happen. This is his dream. He is in his 90s. He is not where he was in that film that you saw. But his dream is for this conference. And having spent many, many, many hours with him, he's a man who doesn't lie. He doesn't want accolades for himself. He doesn't want awards. What he wants is he wants the truth. And he wants people he cares about to prosper. If you go to his house, you don't see it lined is with awards. You don't see him uh, in fancy this or fancy that. If anything, he's up there typing another book. He's usually, he usually have three or four going. He wants this country and people who look like him who and fellow citizens to prosper. And he wants them to know the truth. Just read anything, any book of his. He always contrasts what people believe or what they, the myth with the facts. And uh, so I think one thing you can do to honor him in addition to what you've done so far with this wonderful conference is to live not by lies and not to tolerate it when you know it's not true. We all don't have time to do all the research that the, these brilliant economists have done, but there are things we know are not true and we don't stand up and stop it. And they get wings and they, they get lives of their own and this is how you wind up losing institutions. So live not by lies. It's a motto of mine uh, and at the court, that's why I get in trouble. I'm not gonna go along with this nonsense. If it's not true, that's a lie. So yeah, I admit that I have deviated from time to time from where the court is going, but if it isn't true, I'm not gonna go along with it. Um, in a lot of the uh, policy recommendations you, you said uh, you heard today, a lot of them don't involve uh, the work of the court. They're, you know, the court's not going to repair the family structure in the country for blacks or Thank the rest of the can. country. They, they're not gonna make people take personal responsibility for their actions at court. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> The court, uh, but I just want to say, uh, but you're on the court, and I think um, you have tried to uh, carry some of the ideas you had uh, 42 years ago. Um, so I, I just wanted to read um, a quote that I thought uh, was particularly striking, and this is the case of Grutter, Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003. Uh, you quoted Frederick Douglass in the opinion, and he, he said, uh, if the Negro cannot stand on his own legs, let him fall also. All I ask is give him a chance to stand on his own legs, let him alone. And then you said, uh, like Douglass, I believe blacks can achieve in every avenue of American life without the meddling of university administrators. Oh, I said that? You did. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that might have been the leaked version. I'd have to check <laughs> to make sure it's the actual 
<laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, once again, it's the elites. I mean, they're telling us what we need. And they're, they, they're, there were some really good insights here. That, that the observation that they're not allowing us to excel. You know, I, I, I am enormously blessed that I was allowed in high school, very, very challenging high school, to excel. So what does it do? Once you excel in that environment, you build confidence to take on the next challenges, and they take that away from you. Why are you robbing? I, I, some years ago, I was with some of my college classmates from Holy Cross, and one of them, really great guy, he'd gone to uh, Stanford Law School, and Holy Cross had fairly strict grading rules when I was there, very strict grading rules. And he, we were having lunch, and a number of us, and he said, Clarence, do you realize that you ranked higher in cl our class than I did? And I said, yeah. I said, Steve, uh, how does it feel not to have your achievements discounted? And I think, unfortunately, that's what they're doing. They're taking away a chance to excel by changing the rules. I was fortunate in high school, and the only black kid in the high school, and the only, obviously the only one in my class, to excel in that environment in the 60s. Well, what does that do? That the subsequent challenges are done with much more confidence because of that. So, uh, the, I think that these administrators, these people with these grand schemes, are coming up with something that they want. I, I got into an argument with a guy uh, about admissions years ago and asked him if he would do to his own kids what he's doing to black kids. And he said no. That's why, I mean, if you won't do it to your own kids, and I have recommended nothing and advocated nothing that I wouldn't do for my own son, and I did the exact same thing for him. He went to Virginia Military Institute, so you know uh, that's the school he got in, and that's where he went, and he's glad he did. Uh, and with my grandson, I would do the exact same thing, although I don't have that kind of control. But <laughs> I would never do to others what I would not do to my own. But these people, some of these people, are what they will with two-faced, uh, with a sort of Janus-like approach. They will uh, do to your kids one thing and to theirs another thing. We heard it today, that they live their lives a certain way, and then they tell uh, other people not to follow that. So I just think that, um, that that's the point of it. So uh, I'm sorry I went on so long with my questions, but it was really your answers that went on too long. So I will now uh, like to call, I would like to. Well, you see what I have to put up with. <laughs> Just imagine there's four of us at once. Oh my God. And three of them from Yale. <laughs> so I, I'm going to uh, call on people uh, to ask questions. Um, so uh, just a point of uh, law professor privilege. Um, ask a short question. I will cut you off and silence you if it's not a question you're giving a speech. Uh, the second point, if, you, if I don't like your question, I'm just going to ask my own question. <laughs> so ask good questions. And, um, you know, uh, and oh, if no one has a question, I'm just going to call well, on people you, randomly you and, uh, you know, uh, make fun of you for getting things wrong. But uh, right over here. Go I ahead. Hear. So, yes, very brief questions so we can get in as many as possible. I'm Jimmy Kemp. It's tough for me to be brief. I run the Jack Kemp Foundation. Um, Jack was my father, he was never brief. Um, Justice Thomas, G.K. Chesterton said, was asked what the problem with the world was. His answer, as you probably know, two words, I am. Is the misunderstanding of human nature in our country one of the top problems today that needs to be addressed? And if so, what can we do about it? Uh, actually, I don't know. Um, I think we have a lot of misunderstandings about a lot of things. But I can't tell you that it go just goes to human nature. Um, I, and I, would, I haven't thought about that. Oh. That's someone on this side. All the way in the back. Oh, 
So I don't have a question, but you told me that I could say this when we met on the bus earlier. I, I, have, no, I have no memory of this. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> Justice Thomas, I just want to say thank you for achieving and giving us no excuses. You made it to the highest court in the land, and I want to say thank you to all the men that are in this place today. I think that traditional men and masculinity have been demonized so much that in so many areas, men have checked out. So I want to say thank you for taking a stand and leading this country. We appreciate it. That, can I just say that that was not what you said you were going to say on the bus? <laughs> How about right over? Oh, actually, was someone on this? Are there mics on both sides? Or is right you, here. Oh, just she's right there. Oh, right here. Right here. Yes. Yes, Justice. Thank you so much for being here. My question is, how do you view the pipeline of, of legal talent that's coming through the system today. Is it a problem that we don't have enough people that think, I'll keep it simple, like you, or is the pipeline strong? Oh, I think that there is, after 30 years of the bench, I think it's stronger than you think it is. And I think they are running the risk of inoculating a lot of kids against the nonsense. So the way that we choose, we are able, we are actually inundated with talent. Uh, I had a young woman, and I'm not going to tell you her name. Uh, I interviewed her, uh, and I'm not going to give you any of her, of her uh, particulars because I don't want anybody bothering her, but she walks into my office. We have a long process, screening process, to hire law clerks because there's so few of them, so few that you hire. And she comes into my office after many rounds of screening, and it was the first time I realized she was black. No one, it was so irrelevant in our process that no one had bothered to mention that she was black. And I, and, and I remember t telling the clerks to tell her that. I said, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know she was black. But she made it through. And then when she was told that, what do you think she felt? She was delighted. Yeah. Because she knew that nothing, that that played no role in her achievements, that her achievements were hers. And, you know, the, it is, it's, but no, there's no problem. And, and, and the craziness in the law schools are waking a lot of these young kids up. And I think you're going to see that in the future they're not going to put up with a lot of this nonsense. All the way over there, the professional interviewer. <laughs> Peter Robinson. Another quotation from G.K. Chesterton. Oh, well, brother. <laughs> It is the job of liberals to make mistakes and the job of conservatives to keep the mistakes from being corrected. Does that, <laughs> does that strike you as a good working definition of stare decisis? <laughs> you know, I have no idea. These G.K. Chester, you know, he was a brilliant guy and that's sort of, um, I think the, I think there was a word that was used today uh, that was really interesting because I think it's a central word and it's courage uh, and the way that Walter Williams did it in one of his books from the 1980s is all it takes is guts and I think a lot of people lack courage like they know what is right and they're scared to death of doing it and then they come up with all these excuses for not doing it so even with stare decisis, you will see in a lot of those instances where people start, they run out of arguments. I always say when someone uses stare decisis, that means they're out of arguments. And um, that, um, that now they're just sort of waving the white flag and then that's, I just keep going then. I and mean, just, I think if you have an argument, you make it. But I'm not gonna go along with something. If you buy that argument, then Plessy should never have been overruled. There's no way. I mean, you cannot overrule Plessy. And when you raise that with them, then they don't, they, well, they give you er, ah, uh, er, ah, uh, er, ah. Uh, you know? All right here. Oh, wait for the, wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Okay, there it is. 
Justice Thomas, we know there are deep ideological differences on the court, but we also hear that besides the politics or the issues that the justices get along very well, and we hear about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Scalia had a great relationship. They both enjoyed opera. How can we foster that same type of relationship within Congress and within the general population? Well, I'm just worried about keeping it at the court now. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not the court of that era. Uh, I sat with Ruth Ginsburg for almost 30 years, and she was actually an easy colleague for me. You knew where she was, and she was a nice person to deal with. Sandra Day O'Connor, you can say the same thing. David Souter, I can go on down the list. Nino was, he could be agitated, but then he forgot he was agitated. <laughs> um, the, but it was, it was a, the court that was together 11 years was a fabulous court. It was one you looked forward to being a part of. What you, I go back to the point I made about the institutions, what you've got to be concerned about is just like you see the law clerks. Remember the last four appointees of the courts, including the newest one, I knew as law clerks. These law clerks with these attitudes I'm are your- I'm available, by the way, for, <laughs> if you're looking for more. Uh, you're a little, con you have some confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and you know you do. <laughs> But, I, you know, I just think that the, they bring, that anybody who would, for example, have an attitude to leak documents, those are, that general attitude is your future on the bench. And you need to be concerned about that. And we never had that before. We actually trusted. It was, we may have been a dysfunctional family, but we were a family. <laughs> and we loved it. I mean, you trusted each other. You laugh together, you went to lunch together every day, and I can only hope you can keep it. So it's, what was it Ben Franklin that said, it's a, we gave you a republic if you can keep it? And I think that you have a court, and I hope you can keep it. Can I just follow up briefly? Uh, what's changed? Between, what's, what has changed between that court and the current one? I think the what's changed in society, uh, modernity or post-modernity, uh, I think attitudes have changed. Um, I think the, when I got to the court, you still had World War II veterans on the court. Uh, you still had people like John Stevens, who was a nice man. Uh, you had Byron White, who was a Rhodes Scholar, when Rhodes Scholars were real athletes and number one in their class, a hot NFL football player, Navy veteran. Uh, and you had Sandra Day O'Connor, it was, uh, I mean, so you, that's a different generation. And we were living off the, 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 re, the, the sort of the treasures of that generation. That generation is gone. I am the only member of the court ever to have been born in 1940s. Okay, everybody else is subsequent to that now. And the, uh, the, when I got to the court, they were born in the 1930s and the 1920s. And we're now dealing with post-World War II generation. And as you see it play out in society, I think you're gonna see it play out in the institution. So what's the difference? It's a difference that people who grew up in a different era. And I don't know what, where that's gonna lead you, but we know it's different. Right there, yeah. Yes, you. Uh, I'd like to ask you about your autobiography. I've taught it in my undergraduate class on uh, black conservatism, and it's been well received. And um, I wanted to know, um, one, uh, how did you feel about how the book was received? Um, two, would you consider writing a sequel? Because that book only goes up to when you got on the court. And um, three, um, why did you write the book? Uh, one was what? <laughs> okay. One was uh, how the book was received. Do you feel it was satisfied? very well received. I think the publisher could have sold a lot more if they knew it was going to be that well received. Remember, it debuted number one. Yes. And the New York Times had to rush out and do a book review because it debuted number one in the New York Times. <laughs> and uh, no, I think it, it was, and the people could not have been, especially regular people for whom I wrote it. 
Mm -hmm. It was that's the that was my audience. And um, would you write consider writing a sequel that goes only if I'm convicted of a heinous crime. <laughs> <laughs> So hey, what's, the, the, what's the last one? <laughs> why, why, did, why, did, why did you write it? Why did, huh? why did you write the... Oh, why did I write it? Um, Justice Scalia told me to. 